Namaste, or welcome. My name is Michael Ziani. I'm a field application scientist with Thermo Fisher Scientific. And I'd like to talk to you today about restarting your capillary electrophoresis system. I know we've all been dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic and the shelter in place orders and a lot of other challenges uh, currently presented by this disease. And also, at this point in time, a lot of labs are starting to get up and running again and opening up. So towards that goal, this, I'm going to talk to you today about getting that capital to freeze system up and running again. Right. I've been using these instruments for over 20 years, uh, automated uh, genetic analysis, analysis systems, mostly as a client, uh, but most recently as an employee at Thermo Fisher Scientific. So I would like to share my experience and my understanding of the system with the objective of making the reactivation process, the restarting process, go smoother. So Thermo Fisher has four platforms, the 3730, 3730 XL series, the 3130 series, the 3500 series, and the Seek Studio. Each one of these has their own checklist and these are available online and at the end of the presentation there will be links to those checklists. This presentation is designed to complement those checklists. They are detailed and, and have a very precise uh, order in which to perform the restart process for the instrument. They also have all the consumables needed and the c catalog numbers for the consumables for ordering. So again, I strongly encourage you to uh, download those checklists and use them and then refer to them in conjunction with presentation which is meant to be a complement to those documents. So the topics today will include how to assess the ray and the polymer delivery system, maintenance steps, we'll talk about shutdown procedures, proper shutdown procedures, and calibration steps and then the insulation standards to confirm that the instrument is running correctly. In addition, uh, if you need additional resources, there's web-based resources, troubleshooting, people-based troubleshooting resources, and finally contract service options and support options uh, to provide that peace of mind that you know if there is trouble, you will uh, there's support available to get the instrument running up and correctly again. So evaluating electrophoresis components. So take a look at the instrument and if the array is still present then the next slide is is very important so this is the 3730 with the array still inside uh, this is the seek studio cartridge if it's still inside the instrument the next slide is important and then finally uh, this is the 3500 with the array still inside so if the array is still inside the instrument then it's really critical to check the cathode buffer level what is he, this is an example of the tray for the 3130 and the 3730. The cathode buffer level line is right here. If the cathode buffer level is below the line, most likely the array has dried out, um, resulting in blocked capillaries, and therefore the array should be replaced. Okay. The line is here on the 3500 tray, and the line is just below this white area on a Seek Studio cathode buffer container. So the critical part is to make sure the end of the arrays are maintained and hydrated. That is, they are covered with liquid. If they become uncovered, they dry out very quickly and become um, useless basically at that point because the polymer dries so hard that it blocks the capillary. Okay? And therefore the array needs to be replaced. So you need, it's important to assess whether uh, the array needs to be replaced or not at this point in time. If the array is fully submerged and the cathode buffer level is above that line, then I would encourage you to try using that array and continue to use it because most likely it will work fine. One thing you, I do suggest is removing the array for evaluation. This is the Seek Studio cartridge. Uh, this is the polymer delivery system right here. As you can see, it's clean. There is no debris present on the uh, PDS and the polymer container is over here and this metal piece uh, is chilled and keeps the polymer uh, from, exp from going bad, Okay, minimizing it, uh, maintaining its life. 
As you can see here on the right, there's an example of all this crust here. This is a polymer leak. There's crust here as well, and even crust down here as well. And these are all examples of polymer leaks. This array needs to be changed at this point. And if you see any kind of leaks over here on the other PDS or around the array, then it needs to be changed, uh, replaced at this point, because there's a leak. And something else has more than likely gone wrong with the cartridge. For the 3130 and the 3730, uh, the polymer delivery system is on the left here. You can see it's nice and shiny and clean. There's no particulates, no debris on the outside, no dried polymer or buffer. On the right, though, is an example of a polymer leak. You can see the polymer has leaked out here. Drip down, you can see these, the crust, and it's very hard uh, material out here. So if you do have a polymer leak or a buffer leak and it causes crust or like this, then it will potentially cause several problems. First, it can create spikes in the electropherogram data, creating false peaks. Two, the particulates may get into the ray again and actually interfere with the electrophoresis, uh, inhibiting the proper movement of the bands of DNA, the fragments of DNA. And then the third problem is arcing. And I'll come back to this into a later slide. Okay, this is the 3500 polymer delivery system on the left. Again, as an example of where it's, it's clean, it's looking good, it's properly maintained. There's see a bubble right here uh, that will be removed during the maintenance procedure, so it's not an issue. But here's an example of a polymer leak. You can see the dried crust material here, so it's important to inspect the array and all the surfaces as well. Uh, here's another example of dried crust on the polymer port. You can see all this white material down here and down here and again it causes the same problems in the 3500 that it did in the 3730 and the 3130 and these all need to be thoroughly cleaned so if polymers if its crust is present it can often cause an arcing event and arcing is where electricity basically jumps a resistance point jumps a gap causes a luminous event and it results in burning of the rubber and the plastic in the polymer delivery system. On the left here, you see this crust, and this is what caused the arcing event. So again, it's important to make sure this is removed to prevent these arcing events from occurring. This black right here is an example of arcing. You see the black down here? That's also an example of arcing. It's burnt. Okay. Uh, over here is in the middle is another example. This ring is burnt plastic for the block and burnt plastic as, as well here. Okay. And you can see all this black line is where the polymer dried out and it also caused an arcing event. So if in case of an arcing, the polymer delivery system needs to be replaced. So open up a service call, contact your field service engineer and have it replaced. Arcing will promote more arcing in the future. It can also interfere with electrophoresis, cause problems during runs, and the black material can actually be introduced into the array and cause background haze, which will interfere with the analysis of the peaks in the, in the data, the electropherogram data. So again, it's important to prevent this from happening, from getting this clean, and making sure that there are no arcing events uh, after the process, after the instrument is cleaned up and starting the reactivation process. So cleaning the outside of the array, as well as the polymer delivery system, use only clean water. Uh, and clean water is defined as either double distilled, 18 mega ohm, or molecular biology grade. All three of those will work just fine. Okay, uh, use a lint-free wipe or a silk swab. So your friendly sealed service engineer oftentimes will leave these silk swabs behind, these green plastic, and there's silk on the end of them. So put some water on them, use them to clean. They're very soft and they work really well. And when the the block is cleaned up, then Make sure it's dried with a lint-free wipe. That's important to make sure that because any residual water potentially will dilute the polymer and cause issues potentially with the pump and or electrophoresis. Okay. So there's a possibility that it may be too difficult to get it cleaned. So in that case, I suggest you contact your field service engineer or your field application scientist. Both of them have a special kit for doing a really, really good thorough job of cleaning the polymer delivery system. If you call the field service engineer, that may be an additional charge involved in that. But I would reach out to them to see if what uh, they may be able to do to help get the system clean and get the instrument working properly again. 
And a key point about the clean water, do not use organic solvents. Organic solvents will potentially break down the polymer, uh, excuse me, break down the rubber and the, poly the, pl the plastic and the polymer delivery system. Uh, also, they will introduce organ uh, fluorescence and generate a background haze in the data. Also, do not use detergents. Detergents can potentially uh, interfere with electrophoresis by changing the properties of the polymer, and they will also introduce background haze uh, in the data. Basically, components that will fluoresce during data collection will get introduced to the array and fluoresce during data collection. So do not use detergents. Do not use organic solvents to clean up polymer delivery system. Only use water. So cleaning the inside of the, of the PDS is also very important. And for the 3500, there is a wizard for doing this. You go to the Maintenance tab, connect a conditioning pouch, and follow the instructions from this wizard right here. I recommend doing this three to five times in a row, and that can be achieved without necessarily uh, putting polymer on the instrument. So when you get to the wizard, to the point where it asks for polymer to be installed, simply uh, cancel the wizard at that point, replace the um, conditioning pouch with a new pouch, and then run the wizard again. And you can repeat this multiple times, three to five times, to make sure the inside of the PDS is quite well washed. For the 3130 and 3730, there's a water wash wizard as well in data collection. So go to data collection, wizards, and select this option, and then follow the procedure listed. I strongly suggest using warm water that is water heated at 40 degrees or less and then repeat several times again three to five times so possibly you can have several bottles of old polymer that have been cleaned really well fill them with water put them in that water bath at 40 degrees run the wizard when it says put the polymer on you just leave the water on complete the wizard do not fill the array do not fill the array at that point and then when it's done Take that bottle off, put the next warm bottle on, and just again repeat that multiple times, three to five times, and it'll get the uh, polymer delivery system really clean quite well, and it works really well. Okay, so to go along with making sure everything's working well and cleaned up, uh, cleaning the pump trap is also important. So you see the image on the 3500, this is the front of the polymer delivery system. The syringe that came with the instrument put 10 to 20 mils of clean water same clean water I mentioned in the previous slide. Connect the lure lock, uh, untwist, um, open up the fitting here, and then begin to push the water through the pump. It'll come out the tube and into the side, into the little jar that collects it there. It should be basically pushed through such that the water comes out like drip, 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 drip. You don't want a solid stream of water coming out. That means too much pressure. So too much pressure can potentially damage the pump at this time. So you want to make sure that the, the water is flushed out at a nice even low pressure rate. And that is again the water just kind of drip, 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 that kind of rate. Cleaning the pump on the 3130 and the 3730 series. The same uh, approach. Again you want to use the same pressure. You want to avoid damaging the pump. The first step is to unopen this fitting. Put a couple turns on this fitting to open up the export the, uh, where the water is coming out. Put the water in the syringe, collect the lure, connect the lure lock, uh, un open up this fitting as well, and then push the water through. Uh, a suggestion is to put a small rubber hosing on the end of this tube, be about four centimeters long, and then use a 50 mil conical tube, or commonly known as a falcon tube, to collect the waste. The rubber hose can go right into that tube, and it's a nice, easy, convenient system for collecting that waste. So now the instrument's clean. The array is looking good, or you've put a brand new array on, you've got the array back on, um, and you're ready to replace the other reagents on the system. So at this point, you do want to make sure you replace that array of cartridge, uh, replace the cathode buffer. I know it's been potentially been sitting in the refrigerator, but at this point, it's still good to, to put new reagents on because it's been sitting around for a while, potentially. New anode buffer as well, and polymer for the non-seek studio instruments and then finally fresh water for the 3130 and the 3730. Now you ask yourself I have a seek studio. Mike didn't mention uh, doing any kind of PDS washes or cleaning or anything like that 
on the Seek Studio. That's because that cartridge does everything itself. The moment the cartridge is put in, it goes through a thorough washing of the entire PDS system. So there's no need to um, do anything manual yourself at that point. It's all autom done automatically. Now the computer maintenance for the 3500 and the 3130 and the 3730 is very critical. The computer is a um, part of the instrument. That is an extension of the instrument. So keeping maintaining it is, is very important as well. So the first step is you want to back up the data files and you can do this as well for the Seek Studio backing up the data files. Uh, your favorite location make sure that the information is secure all the effort and time and effort and energy to create the data uh, is not lost due to computer issues. The next step is to clean up the library on the 3500 or clean up the database on the 3130 and the 3730 series and I will go into a little more details in a subsequent slide for that. For defragmenting uh, that's also very critical to make sure the computer runs correctly and has high efficiency. And I'll go into a little more detail on that on the subsequent slide and then finally rebooting. So it's probably best to do them in this order. Back up the data files, purge, defragment, and finally reboot. So for the 3500 computer, the first thing that needs to be done is to duplicate the appropriate items in the library. So select an item, hit duplicate, and make a copy of it. So all the items you want to save, all the protocols, all the size standards, all the uh, other settings that are commonly used, templates, you want to basically make a new copy of those at this point. All right. It does take some time, but it is important to do this, and it's important to do this at least quarterly on the 3500. And since the instrument's being reactivated at this point, it's a good time to maybe take and start that process again. So go to data collection, manage, and select archive is the next step. And then select the date range from the previous archiving until today's event. This will export all of the items in the library, puts them into one file, and you can store them. Presumably they might go to the same location where you back up your data, so it's in a secure location as well. The archive allows you to reinstall the archive and reinstall all those items in case they're needed or for some reason they were maybe potentially not uh, duplicated properly at the first step. The next step then is to purge the 3500. So go to manage, select the purge right here, and then select the date range. So the date range should be the same initial date as the archive, but the end date should be yesterday. That is, do not use today's date. Do not use the date that you duplicated all the files. If you purge those files, You'll basically have to reinstall the archive and redo the process again. So basically the idea is to purge all the previous files, but keep all those files that were duplicated just now because they don't fall in that date range and you're ready to go with the next step. If you do need to restore the items from the archive file, go to archive, uh, migrate to the location of that archive file, and then click restore. And then you can either replace or replace all of them depending upon uh, which files that are needed at this point in time. For the 3130 and the 3730 series, um, it's a little bit simpler. If there are less than 300 runs, this doesn't require cleaning up the database, but if there are more than 300 runs, uh, it is very important to clean up the database at this point. It uses an Oracle database, so essentially acts like a box. So there's only so much space for the software to move the files around and manipulate the files. And even though the percentage is small, when you see this data present full with 300 runs, um, it still needs a lot of space for it to work properly. So when you get to this point, simply plus clean up processed plates and it will clean out the database. Don't be concerned, you're not losing any data at this point. Everything, once you generate the AB1 and the FSA files and they look appropriate and they meet, your, meet the needs or uh, sufficient, there's no additional data in the database that you can provide out of there. Okay, so once those AB data files are generated, AB1 and FSA, uh, there's, go ahead and clean up the database. Uh, there's no additional need for keeping that around. And it is critical to make sure that the instrument and the computer is running properly. Okay. Defragmenting the computer. Uh, so on the computer, 
whenever they collect data, it puts it at wherever point it can find. Okay? And as a consequence, files may be in multiple locations across a hard drive within a computer. So it slows down the efficiency, the ability to recover those files and retrieve and or analyze those files as well. So it's important to make sure that all those files are in the same physical location on the hard drive. And to achieve this then, in Windows 7, you go to Start, Programs, Accessories, System Tools, and finally Disk Defragmenter. And just follow the props, prompts. Excuse me. For Windows 10, there's an apps, an app called Oslogix Disk Defrag. So select that, and then it'll walk you through the steps. And it's actually got a nice little cool uh, graphic here that shows the process by which the defragmenting is taking place. This should be done bi-weekly or at least monthly on the instrument. So defragmenting though has a couple caveats. For the 3130 and the 3730 series, only use uh, only defragment C and E drive. Do not defragment D drive. This is the Oracle database that I just referred to a moment ago. When you clean it up, if you defragment the Oracle database, it potentially will become corrupted and then it will definitely require a reinstall of the software, potentially even requiring the engineer to come on site to re-image the computer as well. So it is very critical, do not defragment D. For the 3500 series, uh, only defragment C and D drives, uh, unless you have 35, unless GeneMapper is on that computer. If GeneMapper is on that computer, do not defragment it at all. Uh, it will potentially cause corruption and maybe even eventually lead to having to have the computer re-imaged again. So again, if GeneMapper is on the computer that's attached to the 3500, do not defragment at all. Instead, what I recommend is reinstalling GeneMapper on another computer, on a third, uh, another computer somewhere else, um, and removing it from the computer attached to the 3500. It's, uh, that 3500 computer is not meant to run Gene Mapper, and if you've got Gene Mapper located on another computer, hey, you can have your favorite beverage there and relax. And in, in most cases, I find that working with Gene Mapper six or any version of Gene Mapper, if you can relax, the better off it is. Okay. So now the instrument's maintenance is complete. The 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 uh, capillary diffuser system is clean. There's new array, all new reagents, all new consumables. Maintenance on the computer is all done, and now you're ready to get the instrument up and running again. Okay, so the first thing you do is a calibration. So at this point, I recommend starting with the spatial calibration, and this is required for the 3500, 3130, and 3730. The Seek Studio does its own spatial calibration. It does do a calibration, but it does it when the cartridge is inserted into the instrument. So the spatial calibration basically aligns uh, parts of the CCD camera with the um, capillary. And so where you get signal from a capillary, which is this peak right here, uh, it will then assign specific pixels to that region, that capillary. So to assess whether a spatial is of good quality or not, the peaks need to be sharp and symmetrical and evenly spaced, which they are. Also, they need to have the, one of these orange plus signs at the apex of each one. And that's the case here for all 48 capillaries of this 3730. You can see in the table down below the spacing is uniform. The units are either 10 or 11 for all capillaries. So this is a good spatial. This is good quality. Also, you want to make sure the signal is in the hundreds to the thousands. And then finally, the, the highest points to the lowest points are roughly two-fold or less. Uh, that's an approximation. Okay, so that's important in assessment, so this looks good. This little blip right here uh, is not bad, but hopefully it can be resolved. So it might be a bit of debris, it might be a micro bubble. So doing a fill with a new spatial will probably eliminate this. If you do three spatials in a row and you get the exact same problem at the exact same location, more than likely it is debris on the array and that's possible this since it's been recently taken out or a new one's been put in. So cleaning the detection cell on the array, remove it from the instrument, take one of those silk swabs with the green shafts, put a drop of methanol on it, methanol on it, a drop of methanol, excuse me, and gently drag it across the front of the array. Um, this is optical glass, it needs to be treated very uh, gently. 
to make sure there's no scratches or anything and this is the best way to clean it at this point. You see here that the protocol is set to spatial no fill. Uh, I strongly recommend doing spatial fill each time. Okay? Fresh polymer does make a difference and it does improve the quality of the spatial and even though it's a little bit of polymer uh, the cost is worth it to make sure that you get uh, to make sure the instrument is properly calibrated as well. So I strongly recommend doing each spatial with spatial with fill in this case. Okay, This is a spatial for the 3500. It looks really good. Signals in the thousands, very even. All the peaks are symmetrical, evenly spaced with the orange on the top. You can see the signal down here. Again, I recommend doing a at having fill selected. Do not use no fill. Okay, It does make a difference and it helps quite a bit and attaining a good quality spatial. Also flushing out the old polymer and putting new polymer in if there's any potential microbubbles or particulates that might interfere with the spatial. Hopefully they will be removed, most likely be removed as well. Okay, so now the spatial calibration is done. The next step is to do a spectral calibration. And here we're looking at a fragment analysis spectral for G5 die set on the 3730. So go to Data Collection, select the Spectral, and then um, you'll basically set up a run in Plate Manager for this and then start the run. Again, you can see here there's green for each capillary. This means it's passed. This is good. We see five peaks for the five different dyes used in G5. They're all uh, very strong, uh, narrow, symmetrical. And well and appropriately spaced. This is good. So you can see up here the image of the spectral calibration. It's important to do a spectral calibration for every die set being used, including Big Die Terminator version three and or version one as well. And you can see here that this is the die emission, and there's areas where there are equal signal from say FAM and VIC, or from VIC and Ned, Ned and PET. Uh, and those potentially are problematic. So the spectral calibration removes this die overlap so that pixels are only assigned to a one capillary and to one die when they're excited. And this is important. Now if we go back to the uh, chart down here, the display of the capillaries, if you see a brown gray square, that means it failed. Uh, so it will automatically borrow the data from the adjacent capillary. Okay, and It's critical that the spectrals be approved when they finished. That's critical. This is spectral for the 3500. You can see that it's passed each capillary. Uh, it's green. All 24 capillaries passed. And again, to go to the maintenance tab, and there's a spectral wizard for showing up uh, for doing this protocol. So this looks really good. Again, the five dies for G5, and it's all passed uh, well, so it looks good. If you have an issue uh, with a spectral, I recommend simply re-injecting it. With a 3500, you can automatically re-inject up to three times to acquire a good spectral for every one of the capillaries. Uh, for the 3130, 3730, you may have to rerun. Now, there's a condition, uh, there's a situation where new arrays need to be conditioned. That is, it's a proper coating of the polymer inside the capillaries so that the DNA, when it migrates through the capillaries, migrates appropriately uh, during electrophoresis. So sometimes the first couple injections may not work so well, and they may need to repeat it again. So again, if a spectral fails or capillary two fail, I might want to consider just re-injecting that same plate again. Most likely it'll be fine. Um, and this may also occur for arrays that have uh, not been used for a while as well. They may need a few injections to get reconditioned again. So now everything is clean on the instrument. Everything looks good. It's all recalibrated, ready to run. The question is, what's the quality of the data? So that's where the installation standards come in, or the sequencing standards. So in this case, we have a set of sequencing standards. These are pre-made sequencing reactions provided by Thermo Fisher Scientific. Uh, they are set up into um, high dye and put into the plate and then checked it. On the 3500, there's a install check module wizard system for doing this. So it walks you through the steps, and you can see here, there's your electropharogram. The peaks are very strong. They're high. They're fairly uniform all the way across, and they're fairly tight. This is all good data. It will give you an objective analysis. 23 out of the 24 capillaries passed by green. That is 500 of the nucleotides matched 
uh, within the criteria to the expected sequence. And in fact, the read lengths are over 690 bases for 23 out of the 24 capillaries, which is really good. You get high quality bases for almost 700 bases for all of them. Uh, the one capillary did fail. Uh, it might have been an injection issue. And again, I could recommend just simply re-injecting the plate and uh, most likely it'll look it'll pass well this is also one of these there's an install standards for the fragment analysis as well and that can be run the same way uh, through this wizard for the 3130 and the 3730 set up the plates run them and then you'll have to analyze the data with like sequencing analysis or with frag or gene mapper uh, to assess the quality but again you're looking for high quality data across the board if you have any questions or concerns about the quality or uh, issues Feel free to reach out to technical support or field application scientists to review the data with you if you've got any concerns at this point. But again, the idea is confirming that the instrument is running well and you've got evidence that everything's looking good at this point in time. Okay. So in case that there may be additional shutdowns in the future or uh, shelter in place orders for COVID-19 or maybe the instrument is down for two weeks for other reasons. I certainly hope that's not the case in the future, but if it does, there are proper shutdown wizards on all the instruments. For the 3130 and the 3730 series, uh, go to data collection, instrument shutdown, and it'll walk you through the wizard of preparing the instrument to be not used for a period of time. Same thing on the 3500, shut down the instrument. For the Seek Studio, it's a little bit different simply want to open the door on the Seek Studio, hit the button to open the door, you want to eject the cartridge, and then eject the plate at this point. So take out the plates and or the cathode uh, buffer container and store them. For the, the cartridge for the Seek Studio, put the integrated capillary protector on the end. That's very important. Put the gray piece back over the uh, detection cell, the gray plastic piece, put it in the box it came with and store it at 4 degrees or in the refrigerator at 4 degrees. That's simple. That's all it is for the Seek Studio. But again, it is critical that the ends of the capillaries, the exposed end of the capillaries, be hydrated at all times. For the 3500 and for the 3130 series instruments, the arrays are shipped with containers, uh, trays, and caps for, both, for the ends of the uh, arrays. So again, uh, um, it's important to make sure you put water, clean water, as I mentioned previously, over the ends of those capillaries and then cover them so they do not dry out. Um, an array may sit out for an hour or so, that's not a problem, but you certainly don't want it sitting it out for hours or certainly overnight. That's what potentially lead to drying out and uh, basically making the array useless at that point in time. And I also suggest uh, checking this if the the shutdown lasts longer than a week or two, longer than a week, then definitely come in and excuse me and check the uh, levels of the water covering the array. So I suggest checking weekly to make sure that the water is still covering the ends of the array and are still hydrated. So if there's additional problems or if you run into any issues in the future, then there's multiple options for support. So the uh, first good source to go to is technical support. It's a great, great group to go to. You can call them or email them. They're available Monday through Friday in their uh, hours, specified hours. This team has a lot of great information. And on the occasion that they may not be able to answer your question, they have access to a lot of internal resources within Thermo Fisher to answer your questions. The next center I want to point out is the Technical Assistance Center, or TAC. If you think your instrument has uh, needs a repair or service, uh, you can contact them by either calling or sending an email, and they'll be able to help assess what the issues and open a service call if needed at that time. The other center we that's available with Thermo Fisher is Technical Engineering Center Tech. Okay, so these are internal experts. This is the uh, the best experts available at Thermo Fisher Scientific as far as instruments go. You can either call them. Uh, this requires that the instrument be under the appropriate warranty serve under warranty or the appropriate service contract. So they you know like can over ad offer advice. They can a lot of times remote into the instrument to assess the problem, or they have uh, basically camera sharing apps available to do a remote uh, session with the user to assess through troubleshooting on the spot. So basically they have remote tools 
to get the instrument running up and quicker as, as soon as possible. Of course, as I mentioned previously, there's the field service engineers. Uh, this is a local contact. Reach out to them if there's any issues or concerns, and they will come on site and repair. They'll also do qualifications and your annual uh, preventive maintenance protocols as well for the instrument. So they're sort of like your surgeons. They'll come in, make the appropriate changes on the instrument, changing the hardware out, replacing it, or fixing it, or troubleshooting, and uh, that's what the sensor with their role is. And then the last one on the list here is the Field Application Scientist, FAS. I'm an example of one of those. Uh, there's a local contact as well. So we can help with designing experiments. We can help with troubleshooting kits, training. We can help with troubleshooting instruments. And then finally, data analysis. So we cover the full spectrum of the use of that instrument. So you can think of us as more like primary care physicians or a great first contact. And again, we can either bring in other resources if needed, if we can't help out as well. So the service and support team has not only these troubleshooting options and resources, but there's additional as well. There's multiple levels of service plans. I'll go into this in a little more detail in a subsequent slide. We also offer qualification services. That is, we will come in and run tests on the instrument and perform, uh, basically validate that its performance meets certain requirements. Okay. We offer a lot of education services. There are videos, other resources online, uh, F Q and, uh, F and, um, Q and A documents, excuse me, fax uh, documents as well. Also, there are uh, sessions called Lab Coat Live, which are a combination of remote training and laboratory exercises. And in fact, FAS can either come on site with pre-designed education services, trainings, or we can even offer custom trainings as well as needed. And I frequently do that as well for my own clients. Finally, there's data management services. So we'll, we will sell the hardware and servers needed for that and the expertise for setting them up and managing those to make sure that your data is protected and secure. And finally, Instrument repairs can be two times faster, okay, um, if with this right service contract. So service plans, there are three options, primary options. AB maintenance, it's the lowest cost. It includes one planned maintenance, a two-day response time for the field service engineer, and access to TAC. Again, you can call TAC uh, and ask and get their assistance for troubleshooting. AB assurance then is AB maintenance plus on-site service parts, labor, and travel are all included in that service, and access to tech. That is, not only do you get access to the expertise, but they can remote in and also offer other remote uh, location services to assist your troubleshooting efforts. Finally, AV Complete is AV Assurance, with the service being upgraded to a next day response time. Uh, there are limited software upgrades for instruments, for software that runs instruments. Also, qualification services can be a part of this complete plan. And then finally, uh, unlimited access to on-site application support. That is, you get access to the field application scientist. For a complete description of each of these plans, go to the following link, please. And then there's a lot of troubleshooting tools online as well. This is the gold site. This covers all of the instruments from Life Sciences Group at Thermo Fisher Scientific. The silver site here is the electrophoresis platforms. Again, a lot of troubleshooting resources, documents, guides, technical bulletins, white papers, and so forth. And then finally, those four documents, those checklists that I mentioned at the very, very beginning are listed here. Each of the link for each one for the Seek Studio, 3730, 3500, and 3130. And again, these are very detailed lists of reactivating the instrument, your caprolectrophoresis platform, and getting it up and running again properly. Thank you for listening today, and good luck, and stay safe.